Well, what's up guys? So good to be back with you again. My name is Quentin Poe. And if I haven't got a chance to meet you, I am the Grand Strail Youth Pastor. So good to be with you. So a couple of weeks ago, right in the middle of the snowpocalypse, I saw a sign that read 2021 feels more like 2020 and a half. And <laughs> I just had to laugh, right? One of those just laughable moments. But then I had a thought. Have you ever been led into an area of your life that you don't quite feel ready to face? That thought took me back to a story of my own, a story during my college years where two of my best friends and I went on a camping trip in, during spring break. And what we did was we, we made all the necessary preparations. We packed a suitcase and we went to the store and bought all the groceries and delicious snacks. And we loaded down a rather large ice chest with full of drinks and our food that needed to stay cool. And I borrowed an old tent from my dad and we threw it all the back, in the back of my truck and we began a two hour drive out to a place called Enchanted Rock State Park. And by the time we rolled up to the front gates, our anticipation for us to just go on an adventure and climb and, and camp was, had swelled so high that the news that we were about to receive didn't phase us at all. So we walked in and the park ranger that was checking us in said, the first thing really was name on the reservation. And we kind of looked at each other like, we don't have one. <laughs> College guys, we make great preparations. So he said, ooh, well, let me see if we have anything available. So what feels like the slowest, like most sloth-like uh, from the movie Zootopia, like the clicks at the DMV just later, he actually tells us that he did have a reservation. A primitive camp spot had been open. And we all looked at each other and unanimous unison said, we will take it. And so we paid the guy and we jetted out of there. We drove over to the parking lot, we unloaded our gear and we began our trek into the wilderness. And when we were in that office checking in, the word primitive didn't really stick to our minds, but as soon as we loaded ourselves down with what seemed like hundreds of pounds of gear, we started asking the question really quickly, how primitive is primitive? And by the time we got to the area that was designated for primitive camping, we were exhausted and the two mile trek of trudging all this stuff had gotten me tired and highly irritable. So much so to that point where we were setting up the tent and I was trying to nail in plastic stakes to Enchanted Rock State Park and I broke them. And I got furious. I got furious and I lost it because I felt like my spirit had been crushed and I was relying on my own strength to face the situation I had been led into. Which brings me back to my original question. You ever feel like you've been led into an area of life you don't quite feel ready to face? Would you spend a few moments talking about that in your group?
So I hope you guys had some good conversation there. And my guess is that you had similar experiences to this in your story too. Like for me, even this last year, I've felt like I've been led into a little bit of a wilderness. A wilderness where I've faced so many questions in areas of my life I didn't know if I was ready to face. Early on in the story of God's people, we see a man named Moses experience a very similar thing. In the second chapter of Exodus, we see Moses flee Egypt after he kills the Egyptian who he had thought he buried and hid. But it becomes known and Pharaoh finds out about it and tries to kill Moses. But before he can do so, Moses flees. He runs away. And he runs away to a place called Midian, where he becomes a husband and a father and a shepherd to the flock of his father-in-law's sheep in the wilderness. And this leads us into this great Old Testament book of Exodus. And the chapter 3 begins where a popular story kind of unfolds, where Moses, uh, he spent 40 years of in Egypt, right? And then he goes out to the wilderness and spends 40 years in the wilderness that all lead him to this point where he leads his sheep to a place called Horeb. Horeb literally can be translated wasteland or desert. And history tells us that the people of Midian, where he had fleed to, were actually believers in the God of Israel. And that they believed that this place he had led his sheep to, the Mount of Horeb, was the dwelling place of God. And it is here that we see God enter into Moses' story through the burning bush. And God himself reveals himself to Moses and he says to him, telling him that he will be the one to lead the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And the initial question that Moses asks God is found in Exodus 3.11 says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I don't know how long it took Moses to forget the reason he had gone to Midian in the first place, but I feel as if his question to God is really a question he's asking himself. Do I really think I'm prepared to face what God is leading me into? No, I don't know if, if this makes sense. But God does not leave this question out there for Moses to ponder on for long. No, in the very next verse, God begins creating a new beginning for Moses by telling him in verse 12 of chapter 3 that I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship me, God, worship me, God, on this very same mountain. Moses didn't think he had it in him to lead. But how good is this? God tells him otherwise. And according to Jewish tradition, a, an entrance into the wilderness meant that God himself was preparing that individual for a new beginning. And this new beginning for Moses' story begins when God tells Moses that he will be with him. And because of that, Moses doesn't have to stay in the wilderness anymore. It's so interesting to me to find that just before he begins his teaching and missionary journey, Jesus too spent time in the wilderness. Luke 4, 1 through 14 tells us this great story of the Spirit of God literally leading Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. And there we see Satan tempt him three different times, testing him and asking and trying to force him into sin against himself and God the Father. But he doesn't rely on his own strength, his own humanness in this moment. After the testing, after each testing, he no, he presses deeper and deeper into the Spirit of God. He presses deeper into the Holy Spirit so that his humanness doesn't give in to sin. 
This is so powerful for us to understand. Before Jesus even chooses his disciples, before his name starts earning reputation for, being, for speaking truth and, and power and, and with authority like no one has ever seen before, before his, his word calms seas, before he, he feeds 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch, before he takes the long road of carrying his own death instrument up the Mount of Golgotha, we see the Holy Spirit lead him into the wilderness, I think because, well, I think because he wants us to know that we have similarities with him. That he's experienced similar things to us as we have been led into the wildernesses of our own story. And you see, I think sin often makes us feel like we're stuck in the wilderness. Like our own stories are are separate from Jesus because we don't feel like redemption can come. But when we seek him, he's faithful to meet us in the midst of our story and start leading us into something new like he did for Moses. Jesus didn't stay in the wilderness after he denied Satan three times. And because of the path that that he paved for us, we don't have to stay in the wilderness anymore either. Do we give in to the temptings of Satan to believe and trust ourselves more than God? Absolutely. But Jesus didn't. Jesus paved a way for us to experience something vastly different than the shame and guilt associated with our own sin. The road to the Mount of Golgotha on which Jesus carried his own death instrument of death paved the way for us to experience um, experience this this grace, this redemption, and the way that Jesus went up on the and died on the cross and, and yelled out that it is finished wasn't just for that. It was for something even more. It brought sin and and death a forever final blow, and redemption to all of us who call Him Lord and Savior. Jesus starts preaching after He left the wilderness, and the very first thing He starts preaching is, we see it play out in in Matthew chapter 4, He says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. And These words laid the foundation for everything he came to do here on earth because the kingdom of heaven was actually himself. Three years of his ministry and his death, burial, and resurrection later, he leaves his disciples with these words in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And these words are words for us too. Words that encourage us to continue to carry on the legacy of Jesus. And as we conclude our time together, I challenge you and encourage you to remember that you have a Savior who gave every last ounce of Himself to redeem your story. Redemption has come. And because we have been redeemed through Jesus, we get to tell others as well. So as you move and navigate through your days and your story, and the involvement with you around with others, would you echo the words of the psalmist? Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. That's Psalm 107.2. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. He is. Is anyone worthy? Is 
anyone home? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Jude conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Oh, is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? And does the Father truly love us? He does. And does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. And does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Alright, we're going to do something a little bit different now. I'm going to sing that same verse over again. And in the parts where it says, He does, I want you, wherever you're at, whether you're in home groups or joining with us online, I want you to sing those parts. So I'm going to sing the longer line and that response when it says he does. I want you guys to sing that out. All right, here we go. Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus our Messiah Forever those he loves And does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone old? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. Oh, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. He's worthy. Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? Is he worthy of this? Is he worthy?